Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Oregon Sahavas 21, where the tavern is virtual, but the wine is real. I'm going to start with a short poem from me by request yesterday, and then we'll have a poem by Baba writing as Huma, as we did yesterday, in the uh, time of great spiritual suffering toward realizing his avatarhood after his kiss from Babajan. So here's my little poem. Keep a clean and empty room with two windows open. Place at one a vase and keep the flowers fresh. Place at one a harp and keep the strings in tune. And when his grace breezes through, fragrant music fills that room. And here's Baba's poem as Huma, The Intoxicated. I am the bondsman and the slave. I am God's doorkeeper. My body is his. So is my heart and soul. In a way, it's he who is always in man's servitude, for in reality, each of us is a guest in the house of the Lord. We pledged we would remember him only. If you are faithful to yourself, you'll remain true to your word. The seeker beat his head against a wall but found nothing, for only that will happen which is ordained by God. In the intoxication of freedom, Huma became wingless, but in my ecstasy, I fly Godwards without wings. J. Baba. So joining us again today are Peter and Debbie Nordine from their home in Asheville, North Carolina. They will both share personal recollections and thoughts of their time spent with the Mondali in the early 70s, just after Baba dropped his body. We start this morning with Peter again, who first traveled to Meherabad in the early 70s and has since made it his residence much of the year. He is a builder by trade and has been a central player in the preservation of historical buildings there. He also worked for Mayor Baba Trust archives and is a contributor to Avatar Mayor Baba Trust publications. He's also a film producer on various Baba topics. He's an historian, uh, from what I can tell of all things in and around Baba's life. Yesterday he gave us a fascinating sampling of the early years of Meherabad and is currently working on what will be a 22-hour documentary on that subject. But today, Peter is here to share with us his time with the Mondali in the early 70s. Take yes. it away, Peter. Hello, good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you again. I wanted to make a few clarifications. You know, yesterday, somebody asked, what was Baba's purpose in working with the women like that? And I mentioned that it was for the purification of the universe. This is actually a comment I originally got from having a conversation on the same subject with Bao Kalchuri, and it was his firm conviction that that was so. Of course, how can we say such a thing? We can only say based upon Baba's explanations. And I always think of Baba's explanation about the circle. He said, I work directly for the universe through my circle. And because Mara and Mani are the two appendages very close, the most personal associations with him, that change would be affected. So anything that happened with them throughout their lives with him, you can expect that there will be ramifications universally. And on other levels, each one of those <laughs> close disciples of Baba had their own personal experiences based upon their sanskaras and their positions in the circle or not. And they had to go through their ups and downs in life. Mara suffered because of her unmatched love for Baba. And he gave her the most highest regard because of that. And he even made comments like he didn't want her to suffer anymore. She had suffered enough and he wanted her to be happy and comfortable. So the other people were expected to create that atmosphere and keep that environment of, of love and comfort around her. I remember a comment of Erich once. He said, well, you know, people thought, oh, Baba's Mandali, they went on great adventures with him. They did so much. He said, but really, we were just the servants of the women. This time after Baba dropped the body, now again, 
I have to correct Steve. I didn't come to India directly after Bob had dropped the body. I was still in high school then. But I came later in 1974. And still many of the old ones were alive then. I'll give you an example. Adi used to tell us a lot about his life. He loved to speak. He didn't when he was younger. But at one point, he said Baba made him stand up and speak to reporters and other people as his secretary. And from then, he realized that he had the capacity and he had the courage to do it. So he would do that. And in the later years, he loved to travel and speak about Baba. If you've seen any of his talks, they are very good. He had a very keen perception from his earliest days. You can consider him a disciple of Baba since the age of 17. In those early years, he went through difficult periods, but Baba pumped him up. At one time, Baba told him, and we know this from Adi's diaries, Baba told him that he was his chargeman and he had to always be near him and different things. This went on for years. But then he told some other people, Baba would say, but he's my chargeman. And of course, eventually, once Baba clarified all this, it basically had to do with Baba's explanations that a sadhguru always has a chargeman. So then people were wondering, who's the chargeman? And he used this, you know, this manipulation of people's mentality. They wanted to be something or somebody close to Baba. And he did this with Adi. Adi was close to Baba. And in a way, ultimately, maybe he will be a a type of chargeman. We don't know. But in the end, Bob explained that the avatar does not have a chargeman. There is no such thing. Why? Because he always comes back. He's the one who is eternally responsible. So for him, there is no chargeman. On the other hand, all members of that circle of 120 plus two get the realization of God before the next advent as something quite unique about the avatar. But Adi used to use this phrase once in a while during his talk. And the Mahir Baba will lift one to the very heights, only to bring one crashing down to the depths. And this is what he did by telling Adi it was his chargeman, pumping him up and keeping him in that kind of mentality. It was his nature. He went through it. And then in the later years, He pushed Adi away. How did he do such a thing? It was after the new life period, especially after the second accident. Because remember, Adi always traveled with Baba. He was on those trips to the West, the three trips in the 50s. But after that, in the 60s, in the later years, Baba started kind of keeping Adi at a distance. And he would make him feel it. He wanted Adi to feel it, to feel the hurt, the separation. One of Adi's duties was to deliver the mail, the messages to Marizad. And so he would come out there. Bob was in Bao. You know, Bao is the youngster in the Mandali, a recycled Mandali from a past life. That was Bao, who had joined Bob in 1953. Young man, And Baba would tell Bao, go out there to the gate to collect the mail from Adi. And you tell him, you tell him, take the mail and say, is there anything else? And you tell him like this, and then you send him away. So Bao would follow orders. He would have to tell Adi this, like that. This would go on for some time. One day, Baba called Adi. Gamarazad. And he told Erish, bring a chair. So Erish brought a chair, put it to my right side. And Erish put the chair there. And Adi thought, now he's going to put me back now after so long. And he told Erish, sit on the chair just to give Adi that thorn. It was like that. 
Adi told me he would go back to Nagar, go into his bathroom and weep. But what happened is when Baba dropped the body, he already had gone through this thing. He already had gone through this hurt and separation. He was able to be strong and he was able to represent Baba to the world when the other Mandali were still in this state of grief because they all only lived for him. They didn't feel that there was a purpose after Baba went, except that all of us started coming then. And they knew because Baba had been telling them that you will see them coming now. And he would make those comments. Now I'll begin giving darshan every day. All these comments that Baba had been making and they couldn't quite make sense of now made perfect sense to them after he had dropped his body. Many of those old disciples did die just before or just after Baba dropped his body. Before, you had the old disciples like Sailor Mama died a few months before Baba went. The later disciple who was a good man from Bombay, Gaswani, he died around that same time, a few months before Baba went. Then, within weeks... Kakabaria died there, and his grave is at Marizad. And he's the only one of the Mandali who has his grave at Marizad, and that's what he wanted. There was a time when Baba was still alive that Baidul got sick, you know. Baidul was the great nemesis of Kakabaria, according to Kakabaria. And Kaka was afraid that Baidul was going to die, and then Baba would say that he should be buried at Marizad. So suddenly, for the first time, Kaka was trying to take care of Baidul so that he wouldn't die. I and mean, he would give him these like cheap little biscuits. <laughs> of course, this was all entertainment to Baba. But Kaka went, and then about six months after Baba dropped his body, Duncan died. Surprisingly, he was only 58 years old. Several others went. Within a year, Baidel was gone before the first Amartizi. Baidel had died. Sarosh, within three years. Before the new life, it was in March of 49 that Baba had designated the cemetery assignments at Marabad. That changed a bit through the years, but at the time, there were certain people who were designated to be buried in the men's cemetery and certain ones who weren't. And it is interesting to see that even at that time, the ones who never were buried there were not included on that list by choice because Baba gave the Mandali choices. Not everyone, but most of them. If you wanted to be in the men's cemetery, do you want your body to be buried or cremated? So they had those two choices. And some, like Baba's brother Jal, chose to be interred into the Tower of Silence in Pune like their parents. That's why his body is not in the cemetery. But Adi Jr., the youngest brother, his ashes are there. He died in London. So he was cremated and his ashes were brought to be interred at the cemetery. That's an example. Padre at the time was told by Baba, and you'll have to bury them because he was at Maribah. But it also was Baba's foresight that Padre would be the one of the old Mandali who would be left to manage affairs at Maribah. And he knew that from that time. Because by 1960, even Pendu had been brought to Marizad to be with Baba. Vishnu died in 1962. And so Padre was the one who was left. And in our time, I recall, you know, Pendu was always the manager of things like uh, the Amartiti program. He was given that responsibility through the years, and he continued to do that after Baba dropped his body. And observing that from them, the absolute attention to detail, the mental focus they had, 
even though their bodies were failing, they had a will that went beyond, way beyond the physical potential of ordinary people. It was an exercise of will to serve Baba. I remember once Pendu and Padre were sitting in his room before Amartiti, and there was some kind of a, a discussion that became intense, and Pendu was insistent, and he was starting to shout. And Padre said, okay. And on the way out of his room, commented to me, anyway, let the old man have his way while he's still alive. Not realizing that he was going to die before Pendu. Because he assumed, because Baba said, and you will have to bury them all, that he would be the last one there, but he wasn't. Everybody assumed that Padre would live a very long time. The reason I wanted to tell you about the men's cemetery was that all these things to me are indications. Baba knew what he was doing. It wasn't a sudden plan. He just didn't tell anybody until the time was right. He only revealed these things to certain people, of course. I think Erich knew that Baba had certain plans, and Baba told him not to tell people. There probably were many things that Erich was privy to that he never told us. I'm sure of it. Things like the five perfect masters and the list of circle people and all of that, I'm sure. These things didn't matter to Erich, only doing whatever Baba wanted. When we went in the 70s, I can say that I know my first day at Marizad, the Mondali far outnumbered the pilgrims. And when they started interviewing me and they found out that I had a big family on all siblings were Baba lovers, including our mother, they were really fascinated. So suddenly, Mondali were appearing from everywhere. All the women were coming from the back. To hear the story, that was something they never heard of from outside of India. That was an amazing thing to them. And Erich would be fond of telling the story, you know, that all those years that they were with Baba, they were so focused on serving him that they never experienced his divinity. And he would tell that story. And Baba said, how was the program? Erich said, well, I guess it was fine. Everybody seemed to really imbibe some kind of divinity. Oh, Bob said, oh, good. Huh. Well, what are you thinking? Mm, nothing, but no, say, well, they feel that way, but we seem to be, we're not experiencing that thing, that divinity. We're preoccupied with your physical welfare. And Bob would say, don't worry about that. In the future, in the future when they come, Baba would say, you will experience my divinity through them because they will want to experience my humanity through you all. So we would go there and ask Irish questions like, what kind of toothpaste did Baba use? And the soap and all those things. As they say, they began to see Baba's divinity, I would say through us, but as the years went by. Of course, I can say another thing about Erich. He used to tell us these stories that were, some people could consider a little shocking at that time. And then gradually, those stories, we started hearing less and less. You know, Erich, when he was with the Mondali, he could be fiery. He had a strong personality. And gradually, as the years went by, I would say I observed him changing. He became mild-mannered. Very few people have the strength to change their character themselves can't do it. They're slaves of their sense cars, and they just continue acting in the same patterns and making more sense cars, and just it goes on and on, bumbling through life. But these people were different. 
You know, as Baba said, their minds only worked one way towards him. That's it. There's no back and forth. In the early days, we used to come and sit there in the hall and some people would say, how can we please Baba? And the Mandali, apparently kind of naive, would tell people things, how to please Baba. And then they would see that they're not doing that. These people aren't pleasing Baba. They just, they're just hearing something. But actually incorporating that into your lifestyle is a different issue. And in the end, I remember, especially Mani would say, forget it. You're not going to please him. Just make an effort not to displease him. If you do that much, it would be, you can't please him. Just try not to displease him. That would be the thing. If you can do that in life, it would be wonderful. So it was reduced to that. And I remember people would ask Eric for advice on certain things, personal things and other things. And he would give some advice. Once when I was a resident there, maybe it was 1980, 81, there was some issue and how to resolve this thing. What was the path forward? I was sitting in the office with Erich and I asked him, what's your opinion on this, Erich? And his answer was, nowadays, my opinion is to have no opinion. And he was like, what's the point? He seemed to be saying, what's the point? Why waste the words? Why waste the words? It was like that. It wasn't that everybody who came there was, you know, people had their connection and they came to get, as Ba would say, the share of the treasure they could carry away. Came to get their share. And some people would come once and we'd never see them again. Okay, it was that much. That was it. The women had their own environment. As, as long as Mara was still alive, you know, those early years for Mara were very difficult. She was lost in that grief. And the only reason she could pull through is because Baba's words to all the women and to Mara and the constant reminding Mara of Baba's wish when she would be lost in her grief and she would be very strong. But what she really appreciated was meeting the young Baba lovers who were really intent on absorbing everything they could about him. Then she would reminisce about the good old days. And it was very sweet, very sweet time. But we observed that, you know, and gradually, Mara, I would say, she went through that phase. First, it was the phase of grief. And that gradually, by the time I got there, was still there, but it was beginning to dissipate. Within another year or so, as the volume of pilgrims increased, she was more attentive to the pilgrims and their lives and how they would be for Baba. And that was something she was interested in. We started doing plays and different entertainments in the hall. And that was something they'd look forward to because they had always done that for Baba also. And then there was a period when Mara seemed to be getting gradually fed up, but just she had had enough. And that was towards the end. And that last play we did for Mara's birthday on the hill, when the Pondal burned down the morning of the birthday celebration, and many of us thought, oh, what's this about? This could be it. And that was the end of 1988. There was no Pondal left. It was all burned down. They quickly set up a shamyana over the women Mondali, but we had no curtain. The curtain burned. There was no shade. Nothing was there. Uh, I think the electricity was even affected, so we didn't have good sound. And Mara kind of sat there with a look like. And she sent the word later, a few days later, that this would be the last play celebrated for her birthday. 
And then we thought, oh, this is it. And sure enough, that year, she developed that, it seemed to be some kind of a tumor exactly in the spot on her brain where she had the head injury. And then she dropped her body on May 20th that year. You know, Pendu there, also one of the old Mondali, suffered intensely after the second accident. And after Baba dropped his body, he also had a heart attack in early 1972, which further affected his speech. So a lot of people had difficulty understanding him. And if he was tired, his speech would become more garbled. But he had a good memory for detail. And some of the details of the early years I got from him were really good. Um, and as I say, he was very attentive to his responsibility. You know, Baba assigned him to be the manager of the Mayor Charitable Dispensary and Hospital at Maribot in 1925. And after Baba dropped the body and they opened up the clinic, Pendu continued to do that work at the clinic every day. He would go there and interview the patients. And for those of you who remember Pendu, he always had this term, which was waiting for his visa, which means he wanted to die. So Pendu, how are you? I'm, I don't have my visa yet. Why is it delayed? Then when Adi died, Pendu said, you see Adi, he had money, he paid a bribe. He, he got, he jumped the queue before me. It was my turn. <laughs> These are great people. Baba said of any of the Mandavi, they would only have one more lifetime. Mara, Baba said it's the end for Mara. But for Padri, Pendu, Erich, Mani, Gohair, they had one more lifetime. And for many of them, it would be as perfect masters. Four of them are first circle people. That means they have to have realization within 100 years after he drops his body. So Pendu and Padre may very well be back right now doing execution of the divine plan. We don't know. Don't know. But Baba did say, according to Sava Kotwal, Baba said they would have to come back as perfect masters. That would be their last life. Once... I went to Hamirpur, I guess it was 75, 76. I went a few times. And Pukar had come to America, and it was a very fine visit for people in America to see a man from Hamirpur like Pukar, an impressive figure, travel around and speak as much as he could about his life with Baba. So when he came back at the Hamirpur Mela, all of these people were enthusiastic and they thought there was conversation and they thought maybe they could go sometime. So this conversation went on, you know, the Mela in Amirpur goes on for weeks and you would travel from one place to another. And so as that was happening, all these people in the conversation, they were expressing an interest to go. Even people like Hirolal, who only did Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jai. Even he was considered a candidate to go because he was a good Baba lover. So there were so many people, I just took down a list of names. He was a long list. So when I got back one day at the trust office, I thought, I'll ask Erich. In those days, you could speak to the Mondley during the trust office hours if they weren't busy. So towards the end of the day, I asked Erich, have you got a few minutes? I'd like to ask you about a certain thing. He said, sure. We were standing in front of the office and Bao also came and stood there. And Bao was very quiet in those days. He would just put his hands behind his back and stand there off the shoulder of somebody and listen. And I told him, when I was in Hamirpur, you know, because Bukhar had gone, all these people are interested in going, but I, I don't know them. How could I exercise discretion and who should be a good candidate and who shouldn't? So I'd like to read this list to you and 
can you make some comments? And so I read the name of List to him, and Harris would make a little comment here or there, uh, sometimes funny and sometimes, you no, know, be careful, and whatever it was. When I had finished reading the list, Erich said, yeah, you could take some of these people, but whatever you do, he points to Bao, and he says, whatever you do, you make sure he gets to America. And how do you want to go with it? No, no, how is it possible? There's so much work here. No, no, impossible. Of course, that's the way he would react in those days. Maybe, you know, seven years later, he did go for his first trip, and we picked him up at the airport when he arrived. So for people who think that Bao was doing all this on his own, no, it wasn't like that. It was not the issue. There was another person from South India during the same few years I met in in Hamipur at the Mela there, who was also doing something. I don't know if it was planning a trip to America or whatever it was, doing something. The problem is he was kind of a pseudo-spiritual personality, and he was involved in that group in South India, that some of the people who had given trouble to the trust were involved in. So, I also asked Narich again to discuss this issue with me. We went into his cabin at Marizad, you know, the Mananash cabin rebuilt there, and had a conversation, and I asked his opinion about this person. Erich told me, well, why don't you do what I do in these types of situations? I said, what is that? that go and ask the old ones. Old ones? Yeah. Adi, Padri, Pendu, they're there. You don't have to ask them. Go and ask them. That's what I would do. You would do that? Yes, of course. Impressive that he had that respect for those people. Of course he would. He was a kid when they were already seasoned disciples of Mamas. So I went and asked each one of them, and they each gave me their own opinion, which was interesting. I asked Adi about him, and he said, yes, yes. Yes, I know. Every time I see him, his hair is getting longer, and his teeth are also getting longer. And I asked Pendu, and he said, He's keeping company with that so-and-so, and and they gave so much trouble. Anyway, let him do what he likes. And at Maribad, I asked Padre about this person. He said, well, what is he going to do? Every poor bastard in the world ultimately has to come to the ocean and dump their garbage. So let him come. He, He may come here. Everybody comes. What else can he do? (laughs) So that was a good experience. People asked me how the old timers got along. And I remember one meeting. There were only two of us. It was a a pre-Amartithi meeting. Amartithi was not a big event then. We would have a few thousand people, a thousand to two thousand maybe. And what was interesting about that Amartithi, first of all, it was three days long then, which was easier because the crowds weren't as big. But everybody who would come had some interesting stories and history with Baba. So you could spend the three days listening to people tell their interesting stories of their time with Baba. And Erich, Padri, Pendu, Adi, they would introduce us to all these different people. It was really good, really good. So anyway, I think two of us were in a meeting uh, pre Amartithi meeting in the trust compound, and the meeting was Padre Penduadi sitting around one end of the table there. I was at the other end observing. The meeting was in Gujarati, which I couldn't catch. A few words, one says this, another replies something, 
Padre says something. Pendu is starting to raise his voice. Adi says something. Pendu slams his fist on the table. There's some shouting. Back and forth. Padre says something. Adi laughs. Pendu smiles. And then they say, okay, meeting over. <laughs> what? That's it? Yeah, it's done. But to observe how absolutely forthright they were with each other. There's nothing like grudges or pandering to anyone's feelings. Nothing like that. They were so ground from their years with Baba that this was their habit by this point. There was nothing. The difference with the Mondley was that they all understood that each of the other was only for him. That's it. They weren't interested in anything else. And I say this once in a while, that the difference between the Mondley and how they associate with people in the world was that with the Mondley, they were concerned about people, yet they didn't care what anybody thought. They didn't care what anybody thought, but they were concerned about people. The world is just the other way around. The world wants to make a show of empathy. I'm empathetic. See how empathetic I am? But they're concerned about what people think about them. They're not so concerned about other people. Just the opposite with the Mondali. They didn't care about what people thought, yet they cared. How can you do that? It means they are selfless. They were concerned that people shouldn't have misunderstandings about Baba, but only to the point that they were responsible for. Ultimately, each individual is responsible to make themselves aware of the truth or not. These people who spent their lives with him were the most natural, honest, loving, selfless, unpretentious. They were ideal people. They were the people that you would say, if you wanted to have the qualities of anybody that you've ever met, it would be them. They also were trained mentally. Their attentiveness was something you would never find in any kind of yogis, nothing like that. The yoga they lived through, that was extremely rare. You don't find that by doing any technique and training and all that. Can't, because it comes from sacrificing the self. And that is something that only, only God can get out of people. You know, Baba's family also had their relationship with him, and they, they really felt that when Baba dropped his body, he was not only Baba, he was their brother. But first they were his disciples. But through the years, their thorn was that Baba would put the Mondali before them. Even Baba's brother, Jal, he would refer to uh, the Jesuwala family. Oh, the Jesuwala family, those newcomers, newcomers. Everybody had to have their, I think of Erich, you know the stories when Erich was driving the car for Baba in that period before the 56 accident, he said he was utterly exhausted and he would plead with Baba, please, this is not good, Baba, please don't, don't have me do this. And Baba would say, what are you saying? I, I am there. I'm telling you to do it. So do it. And so the accident happened, you know, all the stories about that. And when Erich recovered to the point where he could go to Pune and meet Baba, he walked into the room and Baba gestured. Are you happy now? 
you drove and this is what's happened to me? That was his greeting. After Erich pleaded with him, Baba, please don't make me do this. I feel like the wheel is going to go out of control. And then Baba said that very thing. Are you happy now? You drove like this and this is what's happened to me? And there was a court case against Erich. They were investigating it. The charge was that it was reckless driving and he's responsible for the injury to Meher Baba. And Erich didn't care. He would say, at that point, he thought, I'll just go to jail for the rest of my life. I don't care. It's not my issue. So he would go to court on his own, alone. He said he finally went to the court hearing and the judge says, I've looked over this case, examined the issue. It was an act of God's case dismissed. Eric said, pardon me, I didn't hear your honor. Can you repeat that, please, loudly? It was an act of God. You're dismissed. Okay. But anyway, Erich was depressed. You know, for some time, Erich was depressed. Bob had made that comment and he felt, I did drive and I did, why did I do it? And one day, Bob looked at Erich and said, what the hell is eating you? And Bob adjusted, what's, what's your problem? What's bothering you? No, Bobby, no, I was driving. No, you're hurt. And Baba's response is, how presumptuous of you to think you had anything to do with this. What do you say, you know? It was this. Baba's responsible, ultimately, for the annihilation of the mind for his circle. And when you had a strong mind like Erich Jesuwala, he... He cornered that mind. There was no escape. There was no escape. Yeah, okay, Erich will be a perfect master in his next birth, but this is what it takes to make that. It's not fun. It's not easy and it's not fun. I remember so many times Monty would say, uh, kind of playfully. Oh, Baba said I have one more lifetime and it has to be as a man. And we would think, oh, isn't that nice? You know, not taking into consideration Baba's full explanations on how long that process of human reincarnation is that anybody would be on their last lifetime. Because Baba had said that about many of the Mondali, many of those people there, last lifetime. Mina Barucha, was there, you know, and three of the perfect masters told him he's finished, it's his last lifetime. And Baba, originally, speaking of Mina Barucha, is the one who sent him to Upasi Maharaj, and he spent so much time with Upasi Maharaj. And Upasi Maharaj once told him, if you knew what I did to you in your last life, you would never have come to me now. Faramji, working box father. We remember these people because Baba said they were in the last lifetimes and how kind of eccentric many of them were. And Faram used to tell us, don't listen to money and marriage. They only tell you the good things. Meher Baba destroys the mind. <laughs> so we would tease money and marriage about that. So, Money would playfully make this comment about Baba said, I have one more lifetime and has to be as a man. From time to time, she'd say that. We just, oh, isn't that nice? At least one time she said, yes, I have one more lifetime and has to be a man. And Eric is going to have to have one more lifetime and come back as a woman. Baba had said that money is really a man and Eric is really a woman, whatever that means. Of course, he gave explanations about when any individual enters the circle of the avatar, they have to end their role in the circle in the same sex they had entered. So in other words, and he said, every circle member remains a circle member until God realization. There's no in and out. You're in the end game. 
It's over. If you have made the circle, it's done. It's just a question of playing it out, playing out your role. That's the end of it. That doesn't mean that every person lives the life of a perfect one. Bob, before an example, said it's not necessary for Mara to be perfect. After her role, it's not necessary. It's such a superb thing. So being a perfect one would not even be better than being Mara. But there's only one thing that could be better than being Mani Erich Padre Pendu, and that is to live the life of God. To live the life of God is the term Baba would use when he referred to the perfect ones, to live the life of God. So one day, I was sitting in the office with Erich, and I don't remember what the context of the conversation was, but he made a comment. Anyway, I'll have to come back one more time as a woman. I said, Erich, why would you want to do that? He said, I want to know what it feels like to love him. We had some questions from yesterday that were lingering. Should we get on to them a little bit? No, you should tell about Padre and his influence on your life as a young person living at Maribach. Okay. Everybody's nodding their head, right? All right. (laughs) Talk a little bit more about that relationship. Anyway, they all had even... Bao had his special duties given to him by Baba before Baba dropped the body. It was because of those orders that he could go on. Otherwise, he really felt displaced. He got typhoid after Baba dropped his body. His his health was ruined. But he went on and fulfilled those responsibilities of writing. Padre was there from the beginning. Padre had a different attitude. There was not sentimentality involved in Padre's relationship to Baba. He told me, I learned very young that I could not understand with my mind. I couldn't think out this master. The only solution was to keep my mouth shut and do what he said. And that was Padre's policy. Obedience. Obedience was his policy from the very early days. And going back through his life, Baba told him to say no to joining the new life. And then Baba made a big show of it that you see, I'm so surprised even Padre said no. And this shows you how crucial this decision is for each one of you. Don't take it lightly. Even Padre has said no. I asked Padre about this, and he said it was a personal discussion between he and Baba. Padre was the practical, ultimate practical man, and there had to be a go-between. And in the end, Padre spent more time in the new life than most of the companions ever did. He was constantly being called to do something, to take part in something, to be a watchman when, in the end, in the Mononash phase, the four companions, Baba didn't want them involved in being his assistant for the Mananash seclusion. So that was Padre's responsibility at Marizad. The deconstruction and reconstruction of the cabin, that was all Padre's responsibility. The companions had to do their own thing, which was basically pass the time and wait for the next order. Padre wasn't interested in traveling with Baba after the early years when he traveled with Baba and was tortured to a large extent. It's very difficult. He just wanted to do the work that Baba had told him to do. I felt a kinship or whatever with the Mandali, with the old ones. I really had a, I don't know what to say. How do you describe it? But, um, an affinity like relatives or something like that. And because I was a working person and Padre was a practical working person, there was an association through that also. I was interested in being there at Narabad from the beginning. Hearing 
the experiences from him. But he, I would say, was the keeper of the atmosphere. He was there at Maribad from the very first day and most intensely involved in Baba's early activities and all of those things that ever happened at Maribad, Padre was always involved in every phase of the work there, everything. So for him to be left there as the manager from the time Pendu was taken to Marazad, it was Padre and Vishnu, and Vishnu died a few years later, and then it was Padre Sidhu was there taking care of the must. Babji had died, had dropped his body, and only Muhammad was there. And so Sidhu was taking care of Muhammad. Sidhu died in 1975 in October. And it went on like that. We imbibed that atmosphere of Maribad that was there with Padri. How to explain it? Those of you who have been there, I see Dale shaking your head. How to explain it? It was before electricity, before traffic, it was quiet and fresh. There wasn't much water, so there weren't even many birds. It was just quiet. In the evening, at night, it was just peaceful and quiet. And that divine atmosphere was there. The old buildings were there. Or something. Can you talk about how Padre dealt with you young? How did he teach you or sort of show you the ropes or, you know? Well, he reacted to each person according to how they were and who they were. My father was more severe than the Mondali in many ways, so I had a natural training by the time I had arrived there, and I didn't have any problem. And it was not only that, it was that I was really interested in being there with them and being involved in the, in the effort. And what I recalled is based on memory, as I said, we would sometimes write little things down, but most was not taking notes or anything. It was a very casual relationship where we would hear stories. Those stories really struck chords with us, and we kept them deep in our memories. But mostly it was the way they were, to watch how they were, to day after day be exposed to that attentive mentality and that oneness and purpose that they had, that selflessness. They were really slaves of the perfect one, no doubt. They were real slaves to the point where there was no issue about it. It was habit by that point. There was no other thing for them. There was no other thing for them to do. Padre had his own frustrations with the way things were sometimes. He was very old school. You know, I think when they voted for electricity at Maribad, he was the lone trustee dissenting just to make a stand, just to make a stand. <laughs> he didn't want electricity. To him, it was like all those years they got by without it. Why bring it? But, of course, the Mondelian knew on a practical basis, and based upon what Bob had said, it was just that Padre was making a stand to preserve the old as much, as long as possible. Of course, when he died, then things had changed because he was the lone authority at Maribad. 1977, early 78, when I first became an official resident at Maribad, there was some discussion back and forth. I'd already been staying at Maribad, but to get that confirmation as an official resident, I had to speak to Money. She was the chairman. So I went back to Padre and I told them I spoke to Money and uh, she has no objections and is happy that I could stay here as a resident. 
And he just looked at me and said, well, I told you that in the first place, didn't I? It was like, that's not a big deal. It was like, they had a way of saying yes to you by making you think, well, of course. Why did this? Not making a big deal of things. Yes, please, or nothing like that. Practical and straightforward. I had a great relationship with Padre. I would see the way people related to Padre and think, they don't know what they're missing. The Pilgrim Center had opened and Padre was sitting on his veranda and all the people would be over there socializing and whatnot. And I would go and sit with him and I think, they're missing their chances. They're missing their chances. I remember one day at Maribad, middle of the day, I was standing near the Jopti in the table cabin there. And a couple happened to wander into Maribad. Indian couple, excuse me. Uh, so this is, uh, I see the sign, Meherabad. This is Meherabad. Uh, is this uh, the place for, I said, yes, it's Meherbaba's main ashram was here. His tomb is up the hill. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you're here? How long have you been here, of course? You stay here? Yes. What? What? Uh, you're interested in spending your time here? Like, couldn't quite grasp it. Padre happened to be on his rant. I said, here's one of the people who had been with Meher Baba for so many years. You can meet him and speak to him. Okay, they came over. He was a professor of something, and she was also a highly educated person. And there was some conversation, and I observed them asking Padre certain things and issues. They'd ask him, but what have you gained by spending your life with Meher Baba. He says, I've gained everything. Everything? You stay in this room. He's living in that small room. He has a bed. His dresser is an old crate that's turned on the side. It's about this big. All of his worldly belongings and wardrobe are in this little crate. That's it. Except for his jacket that hangs on a peg. Everything? Yes, I've got everything. Everything that I need or could ever want. Plus, I have the giver of everything. Well, okay, yes, I have my own uh, thoughts and philosophies. You may have that. Let me ask you this. You have friends? Well, we have some friends. Are they always very good to you? Never let you down? No, make him your friend. He will be the one friend who never let you down. Let's get back to the questions that were lingering from yesterday, please. Uh, Peter, you you shared that wonderful uh, anecdote about Pendu waiting for his visa. Uh, And so I'm wondering, we have a workshop this afternoon on aging with Baba. And... Based on your observations and experiences with the Mondali, their aging process, and their facing death and dying, what can we learn from that? And we have nowhere near the capabilities or devotion that they have, but so many of us are in this end stage of life. Mm -hmm. It's all based upon our values, our sense of values. Baba has given great discourses on the very subject One of the best ones happened in 1926 when his brother, Jamshed, his elder brother, died just after celebrating Baba's big birthday there at Maribad in 1926. And the Mondali were struck that Jamshed should die at such a young age, and there was concern, and it was back and forth to Baba. Baba was unconcerned, and he made some casual comments, and they were very puzzled. And because of the conversation and the back and forth with the Mandali who were close to Jamshed, Baba gave a beautiful discourse about death and what it means. So that was one of the first ones. And remember Baba's phrase, die before you die. 
There's a wonderful little explanation in one of the books, Die Before You Die. Essentially, what he says is, the one thing about everything that is born is that eventually it will die. If you face this fact, just consider yourself already dead, and then you're free of it. We talked about Galore Shah yesterday. You know, he had his coffin. He had his coffin in his home. Adi told us it's fascinating. That family, as I mentioned, was very close to Galore Shah, the saint. And before 1921, really, Baba referred to Galore Shah as the Wali Galore Shah. We call him the Wali, which means fifth plane, a deaf person. And during that time, Adi said he went to Galore Shah's little home once. In his home, he had a large table in the main room there. And on that table, he had his coffin. Inscribed, by the way, in Urdu on the side of his coffin was a phrase, he who dies before death lives eternally. Something like that. The rough translation of the Urdu phrase inside of Galori Shah's coffin. He who dies before death lives eternally. And that day Adi went there, the room was dark, the curtains were closed, and there were candles lit all around the room. And as if he was waiting for Adi, when Adi arrived, Galori Shah greeted him and then said, Today I have buried my last desires. And he climbed up onto the table and lay down in his coffin. And Adi thought, what the hell is going on here? What is this? Wow. That was his experience. He said the next time Baba referred to Galore Shah, he was the peer of Galore Shah, sixth plate. For us, it's not an issue. We live our lives just remembering him. You think of it this way. The process of human reincarnation, Baba says, is generally 8,400,000 lifetimes, give or take 10,000 here or there. Who's counting? Right? It's the natural process. It means the sense cars of individuality after the process of evolution of consciousness take that long that long to just play out. And ultimately, it just plays itself out and it's, it's done. This is in general, in general. If you take a lifetime and assign it five minutes and multiply it by 8,400,000, that will add up to 80-some years. So if you took the average lifespan of an old person, 80-some years, and assigned five minutes to each lifetime, being on your last lifetime, you're living the last five minutes of your life. So now we met these people who were in the last lifetime and they were already 80 years old. And, you know, they're just the shooting stars of existence as an individual. They're just psst, almost gone. Like that. Baba's explanation, there were 18,000 planets with human beings on them. But only on earth can that balance between the heart and mind be achieved and spiritual progress be possible. And on that planet, out of those people on the planet, only a few of them are actually consciously, spiritually inclined. Now the figure has become such a minority. At this point, there's nothing left to do, but don't worry, be happy. So, Peter, we now have three questions. Okay. Actually, Peter, what you just shared is a great segue into what was the question that arose in my mind several minutes before you spoke that. And it's about what Baba said, which I feel like a parrot that doesn't have any idea what the meaning is of what I'm saying. But from my limited understanding, Baba said that when the avatar comes down and brings together his circle, they are composed 
of something called yoga yoga sanskaras. Now on one hand, there's whatever those are. Okay, that's not yoga yoga sanskaras, that's vijnani sanskaras. Yoga they yoga sanskaras are the perfect masters. Sanskaras. Okay, so they get vijnani sanskaras. sanskaras. I vijnani. also don't understand right. what those are. But the essence of my question is, you talked earlier about, of Baba saying about several of his mandali, that it was their last lifetime and they would become perfect masters in their final lifetime. I don't mean it was his last, you know, anyway, they had one more life and they'd be as a perfect master coming up. So how do these Vidyani sanskaras, what does it mean that he composes them if they're also a drop soul that's been through this process maybe a lot quicker than some of us, I don't know, of 84,000 lifetimes. Uh, 8,400,000, yes. So what Bob, how Bob explains what happens there is that Parabda is the Vedantic term. Parabda means the, uh, the sum of your what do we call it, sanskaric balance sheet, okay, is parabda. Parabda means the way sanskaras move through the law of karma. But vijnani is a transmutation of those sanskaras that drive the law of karma. So the difference is that there's no binding in vijnani sanskaras. They are transmuted, but it is, there's no binding there. Term literally means the threshold, on the threshold of divinity as vijnani. They're due to a transmutation of impressions. And as Baba had explained, this happens through many, many lifetimes. Thousands and thousands of lifetimes. It's a gradual process. And of course, not every individual is destined to be in the circle of the avatar, or for that matter, in the circle of even a perfect master. It's not the destiny of most to be in any circle, but it could be for people like us because we have this affinity to the personalities. What do you if, mean by it happen, this happens over many, many lifetimes? Well, there's preparation, of course. Uh, first they, of all, as Baba had explained, there is fate which is due to lifetime at a time, your sanskaras, so your karma. The working out of the law of karma is fate, but ultimately there is destiny. Destiny is different than fate. So there's the destiny of the soul, which is the ultimate. It is what that individual soul will experience in the end game. And Baba says, this nature is inherent from the very beginning when the soul was spewed out as a drop from the ocean. It was whatever the makeup was, there was all actually innate and would be expressed because in infinite consciousness, everything is in the eternal now. So that is already there. It's just that it goes through the game of time and space and creation projected on the big screen of Ishwar. So let's take Mani as an example, mm -hmm. uh, who is destined for one more life as a man, a male perfect master. Mm -hmm. Did those Vinyani Sanskaras, did she pick those up like lifetimes before she became Mani Irani? Many lifetimes, yes. Okay. Many lifetimes. But okay. what happens is by the time they enter the circle, there's nothing but vijnani sense. They have been completely transmuted. It's just a question of, when I, I'll say the first circle. The first circle has been completely transmuted. I don't know if that's so for the succeeding circles, but it seems so. It seems so. What do you mean by completely transmuted? In other words, there's no karmic burden. Baba put it this way. He said about his circle members. In, in 1927, he drew a little sketch 
of wheels. And he said, this represents the minds. This is the minds of ordinary people. And the wheel was doing this. And he said, this is the minds of my circle members. And the wheel only turned one way. He said, why is this? Because their minds can only turn towards me. There is no oscillation. It's not possible for them. And in future years, as he gave further in-depth explanations about the tendency of the minds of the circle people, he said, whatever their natures are is due to the impressions that they are left with. The impressions that they are left with are specifically for the purpose of fulfilling the work of the master of that circle. He said, so even if they do such things as murder someone, it is the responsibility of the master to bear that because they are made for that purpose, for him to access that into humanity. Baba has explained nicely about what is left for certain people in circles or for certain people who have a link to a master. He said he won't. People shouldn't have the impression that now you're all clean and you're just a little bit left and everything is beautiful and peaceful. Baba has said some of the desires of a particular type are left intact in that person because they are of service in the specific work that the master, we're talking about the avatar in this case, that the avatar has to do for humanity through them. Because remember, the circle people are archetypes, and even the succeeding circles are connected to each archetype. So through the first circle and down through the succeeding nine circles, all, Baba says, all those connections are there. And as he said, I work directly for the universe through my circle. And through the circle, all those connections, as Baba explained, are affected into the universe. And because of the little quirks or defects or weaknesses, he is able to access that in humanity. If they were all mare and money, or if they were like Marijuana and Jessawala, there would be no good effect, ultimately. He needed to have the Baileys. You know, he needed to have people like that around him. Who, And that's not something we should aspire to, but those people had that nature. And it was useful for Baba to have that. It was useful. Thank you very much. Mostly, though, we don't see it as that. We see it as kind of personality quirks, not as some major defect. We don't see that. We see like a little personality quirk or something. I think of Gulu and Jalu on the hill. At, <laughs> you know, at the Samadhi, and you'd hear this kind of, people would be at, at the Samadhi, and you'd hear this kind of ranting and raving. I said, yeah, that's, have a good look. That's what the end of the trail looks like. That's it. You want to see the end of the path? There it is. Where some kind of sense cars are just kind of lingering there, dangling that person still into life and creation. You can't say what it is, but it's all useful to him. So. We have a couple uh, more that, if it's okay, yes. I'll say. Meta says, uh, what happened to John Shebb's wife after he died? So, John Shebb's wife was Big Korshid. Big Korshid was the daughter of Shireen Mai's brother, Dinsha, and his wife, Rowat. They were from Karachi, and she, as was at least traditional in the Parsi community at that point, they were cousins and they were married. That is, Baba's brother, Jamshed, and Korshed. But she also loved Baba, and she was one of those first six women who were the first residents of Maribad. She stayed at Maribad. She stayed in the ashram till 19... 19- 33, when they left Nasik in 1933 and returned to Marabad in November of 1933, when the women were about to begin that very intense period of sequestering on the top of the hill, Big Korsh had made the decision to go and live a normal life. And as 
small course, should Nadja and other people had commented, she was not so interested in leading that life of extreme sequestering anymore. She just wanted a normal life. And what happened is she remarried, and the man she remarried was not in favor of Baba. So she lost connection. She lost connection to Baba through all of those years. And then, at one point, Omadana Chanji heard through a friend of his that, hey, Mayor Baba's uh, cousin, seems she lives over in that area there. She's old now, but she's still alive over there. So Falu went and contacted her. I believe twice, not just once. And Money asked then that he should bring her a box of sweets. So he brought her a box of some pedas or some those milky sweet things and talked to her a little bit. And she was so happy to hear from anybody from Baba. And he talked to her and gave her as much information as he could. Remember now, we think in terms of the way things are now, but in those days, people didn't have telephones either. Only a few people had telephones. And they came from an age where they didn't know how to, I remember watching Ball in the Two, picking up a telephone. What do you do with that? I, hello, what is it? Not you. <laughs> you know, and he was an educated man. Couldn't use a telephone. So what happened is after Falu went and contacted her, she died about a month later. So wow. that circle of connection had been completed, and then she died. A question from Ellen. Peter, she says, what years did you live in India, and how did your whole family become Baba lovers? We'll start with the how did our whole family become Baba lovers. It's an interesting and long story. I'll try and keep it short. Our family had an interesting connection to Prague. Our parents got married on November 8th, 1952. Our father was in the Marine Corps during the Korean War, and they were married in Michigan. And to get back to San Diego, where he was stationed, they drove down south and then drove west. And they passed through Prague, Oklahoma, and stayed in a motel. Uh, 1953, July, my mother was pregnant with Dave, who is our eldest brother. And our grandparents went out to California and picked her up, and they all drove back, her grandparents and uncle, I believe. And they returned and stayed in Prague again and stopped at the same place. They stayed, she said, they stayed at a little motel. It was nothing much. Our grandfather had a great sense of humor. And he would make jokes about the place. He said, oh, these bathrooms are so small, you have to back into them. <laughs> um, but they were both obsessed with the atmosphere of Prague. Our mother says they sat there on a the little bench outside in front of that thing. And my grandfather was obsessed. He would say, what is it about this place? There's something here. There's something special here. But what could it be? It's not as nice as our little town. What is it about this place? There's something here. And our mother said, yes, I feel it too. This is now our father's father and our mother sitting there discussing this. They even spent an extra half a day there and he wandered around the town talking to people, trying to find out what, is there something special here? The only thing he would regard special is the church of the infant Jesus there, Czechoslovakian Catholic Church. Otherwise, there was nothing spectacular at all about Prague. Anyway, years go by. Um, that grandfather, by the way, his name was Peter Nordine. And he committed suicide on Baba's birthday in 1965. Not knowing anything about Baba, a few years later, when we came to Baba, I remember the date and finding out what Baba's birthday was and thinking, that's interesting. It was as if Baba was confirming, yes, this was destined to be 
but I was always there. It was like that. And then when the little book, you know, when I first came to Baba, we couldn't get literature. I, the only place we could get books about Baba was either from Rick had just started doing things in California or we'd go to Myrtle Beach and Kitty had a bookstore there. And whenever we would get to the center, whatever extra money we had, we would have to carefully budget, you know, we were not people of means. We had to carefully budget and spend whatever we could on books and Kitty was always encouraging us, you know, and she'd give us a couple of things also. And Tom and Dorothy Hopkinson had written that book, Much Silence. And when that came out, we picked up that book. And a while later, in our house in Michigan, in Upper Michigan, our mother was reading that book, and she shrieked, That's it! He said, what? what do you mean, that's it? What are you talking about? That's it! Oh, we were there! I said, what are you talking about? Prague, Oklahoma, uh, Baba had that accident. We were there. Oh, now it all makes sense to me. So the story, you know, came out from there. Uh, by that time, I can't say how it happened. We don't think otherwise. It was very natural for us. Everybody will tell you it's because Baba is who he is. And of course, it's not what's so spectacular about it. We don't look at it as anything special. It's just that everyone had the connection. Now, we didn't know at the time because there was another family in Gwyn, two other families in Gwyn, and most of the siblings were Baba lovers too. So we came from this very odd place in the Western Hemisphere, and it's known as the place of the highest concentration per capita of Baba lovers outside of India. 30-some people from our little town of maybe 2,000, 30-some people have been to Maribad to bow down at Baba's tomb. It's remarkable. But how did you hear Baba's name? You didn't tell them. If you haven't read the book, Carolyn Ball wrote a book called Meher Baba's Next Wave, and our story is in that. So it's explained in depth in that little book, but we were Catholics. And the, one of the other Baba lovers in Gwyn, we were altar boys. His family and our family, we were, between the two families, there were six or seven altar boys. <clears throat> so it was either a rehearsal, a practice for the midnight mass, either Christmas 68 or Easter 69, and I don't recall exactly when, but this other Baba lover, you may or may not know him, Dave Nilger, happened to be talking to another friend of ours. We're 13, 14 years old. I was 14, Dave was 13. I had just turned 14. And Dave told the other friend of ours, my mother just received some books from my Aunt Anne, her sister, about Meher Baba. Oh, Mayor Baba, what's, what's he the mayor of? No, not Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba. Yeah, so what? What's he supposed to be? Uh, he's the Messiah of this age. He's Christ returned. What? <laughs> you millions are all crazy. God, you believe that? Ah, but I just overheard the conversation in the name, you know, and then it started. And it started all through high school. This whole thing started, and it was a restless search for truth. And it was easy to go through the process because it basically eliminated that which was not true, which was all the whole atmosphere, the social thing of high school and all of that. I liked sports, and I liked to learn things, and I only wanted to learn what was practical for me at that point because I realized that I probably wasn't going to spend my life working to go to college. And I could make money if I had practical skills. So I focused on science and math and industrial arts, quit band, did everything like that, and just focused on science, math, industrial arts. 
while I had the chance for free education. Smart thinking then. I got into experimental drugs too. I'm going to tell this story, uh, which I don't tell too much, but you asked the story, so I'm going to give you the background. Part of the mind expansion thing, you know, was the use of psychedelic drugs. Some of you have gone through the same thing. There were all those personalities at the time. Richard Elpert had eventually written that book, Be Here Now. In there, he shows Mayor Baba, and he talks about his stuff with LSD and meeting Neem Karoli Baba and all that. Of course, there's still nothing that's in his work that says, Mayor Baba says, don't take drugs. As a senior in high school, the only book I could find on Meher Baba in a bookstore in the university town near us was Beams on the Spiritual Panorama, which I bought, and I just thought it was fantastic, but wow, something that was really elevated. The explanations were very high. I couldn't absorb it all. I didn't have the frame of reference yet to absorb all of what was in there whatever I could, I could tell. The part I can get, the part I can digest is tremendous. So what about the part I don't understand yet? It's got to be good. Besides that, we couldn't get much information. There was no internet and none of those other things yet. But I did have these other books. Uh, Timothy Leary, of course, is well known. And going back to Aldous Huxley, there was all these other things. And there was philosophical pursuits people had. I got a book by a guy named Alan Cohen. But it wasn't our Alan Cohen. It was another one who happened to be a proponent of psychedelic drug use to expand the mind. So I had read this and I thought, this is really, yes, Pharmacology, this is the answer. I think this should be a possibility. So I was interested in this as a junior in high school. I thought, okay, this is something. So I had experimented with psychedelics a few times. I can say my subjective experiences, yes, it was this thing. But it seemed like every time you used a psychedelic drug, it was also a chipping away of the psyche. So it was a simultaneous give and take. You would experienced something that felt like expansion. And at the same time, there was a bit of a disintegration of the psyche, which itself had to experience the expansion. So ultimately, it didn't seem like a winning game. There was a cost involved. And this is something that I don't believe the average person who uses psychedelic drugs can perceive, because that disintegration of the psyche is the very thing that prevents them from realizing. You have to be a little bit, there's a loss of purity, innocence, and the chipping away of disintegration. Anyway, I had a friend, a good friend, who was also, I would say, a seeker of truth, but he did it through the intellectual medium. He was one of those persons who considered himself an atheist or an agnostic at best. And it's easy to see, I would say, in the Western world, the biggest incentive for people who follow atheism or at least become agnostic are the religious people because they created a box for God that is exclusive. And if you don't find that comfortable and you can't fit, you're out. And most people react by saying, okay, that can't be God. I don't believe it. So he was one of those people. What was he reading? He was reading philosophers, but particularly Nietzsche. And he was very serious, very seriously trying to solve this issue of existence. And after reading Nietzsche, he reached the point where he realized nothing is real, nothing matters. And he became very upset and really mentally anguished about this. He didn't have the God part. Where Baba says, nothing is real but God. Nothing matters but love for God. 
didn't have that part. He only had nothing is real, nothing matters. So he was lost in this nihilistic angst. In the meantime, I was reading these so-called pioneers of mind expansion and telling him about that and encouraging him, maybe you should try this. It may be something that would be good for you. So sometime during the winter, early 1972, I think it was, early 1972, we were seniors in high school. He finally said, you know, I want to try it. I have to try it. So he came to our house. We had a big house and we were on the top floor and he tried it and he was good for a while. And then he experienced what the psychologists call depersonalization or what we call a bad trip. So he was there. And at that point, it was not good. He was on the floor, like squirming like a snake. And at that point, another mutual friend of ours came to the house and said, hey, I was going up to a lecture at NMU tonight. I said, oh, yeah, what, what is it? He said, maybe you guys would like to come. I said, what is it? He said, it's a lecture on alternatives to psychedelic drug use. And being open-minded, I thought, okay, I'd like, I'd like to hear that. And he looks at our friend and says, what's up with him? I said, oh, he dropped acid. Yeah, it looks like he's having a great time. Uh, he couldn't walk. Couldn't talk, couldn't walk. So we had to wait another hour or so anyway. In the meantime, we carried him to the car, put him in the back seat, still not talking. Drove up to NMU with a car full of people. It's dead of winter in the UP, just cold and stark. Maybe there were even northern lights that night. We got up to NMU and went to the talk. The lecture had already just begun. And who was the speaker? Alan Cohen. Except now this was our Alan Cohen. And I was confused. Alan Cohen? Now he's saying this, but I have this book. Could it be what? I couldn't place this thing in my mind, Alan Cohen. But I was listening. He was making a lot of sense. And, you know, he was very seasoned at this game at that time. He was one of the three that Bob had ordered to travel around America and speak about the harmful effects of taking these drugs. So we're sitting here in the audience, and every once in a while, he would carefully drop Baba's name and, and as a reference, that he says this and he says that. And he would talk about a few of these things. And every once in a while, of course, one of these college acid heads would stand up and try and challenge him. But what about that, man? You know, and of course, he's seen these arguments a hundred times, and he would carefully deconstruct their argument. It was nothing. He had done this so many times. In the process of the whole lecture in that peaceful atmosphere, of course, my friend, it was the perfect atmosphere for him to come back to normal, to hear this information and just come back. And he gradually recovered from his bad experience there. And afterwards, we got back home and my friend says, so he says, Mayor Baba says these things are harmful. What do you, well, now what do you say? I said, it must be right. It must be right then. And that was it. In ensuing years, meeting Alan Cohen and discussing this, and I told him about the whole thing, and I said, you know, that other Alan Cohen, he says, actually, you know, there were two more. I said, yeah, did you meet them? He said, yeah, I met them, and they were both proponents of psychedelic drug use. Can you believe that? Wow. He says, yeah, I debated both of them. You did? I mean, first of all, you're in, you know, if you're in San Francisco, Alan Cohen is going to be debating Alan Cohen about the subject of LSD and psychedelic drug. What? If you're an acid head, it's like, oh, man, he's debating himself. <laughs> anyway, he said, the one was nothing. He was, he didn't have anything. The one who wrote that book, he was a little more clever, but he said, I killed him in a debate.
I said, you know, by the way, did you ever go back to Marquette to NMU to lecture? He said, no. And I started thinking through the years, you know, what are the odds that all of this could happen the one night that our Alan Cohen was scheduled to give his lecture at NMU? So I look at this, just consider the odds. What are the odds? And it's, it's obvious. Mayor Baba sent his own to save his own. At the time, it was proof to me, Mayor Baba is not a dead man. Nothing like that. This is the kind of thing that makes you think of infinite consciousness. How does this work? How is it possible? So that's how Mayor Baba saved our group, our families, from this thing with drugs. Because at the time, it was an easy and harmful digression for those who considered themselves seeking the truth. People are still lost on this path. On the possibility of using psychedelic drugs for mind expansion. And you know what Baba told Robert Dreyfus when he sent Robert back? He said, I want you to tell the young people in America about the dangers of these drugs. They are harmful physically, mentally, and spiritually. I want you to tell them. He said, they won't listen. They won't listen. But still, I want you to tell them. I made that first trip to the center within a few weeks after graduating from high school. Had made the reservation to go to the center. As I said yesterday, I wanted to meet those old ladies who had lived with Meher Baba in India. And just being there on the center for a few days and vibing that atmosphere and meeting them, it was sealed, everything. And I got back home. And one by one, all of the siblings just felt it. The contagious love. Wow. And that's how it happened. What was the next question, please? Also, Ellen wanted to know when, what years you were at Maribyrn. I started going, as I said, then in the mid-70s, and I would spend three or four months there in a season, go back and work, earn money, go back to India like that. And eventually, then 78, then 79, came back with the entry visa. And we got married in 83. And then after Debbie and I got married in 87, we went back for two and a half years. And she got sick with Hodgkin's disease, and we had to come back to America. And since then, we've been trying to go usually four or five months a year, usually in the winter. Oh, of course, we can't always make that like... Yeah. Now, with the COVID thing, we can't do it. Okay, Jim, your turn. Well, uh, Peter, you mentioned about mathematics. And sometimes I'm thinking about 8,400,000 lifetimes. It can sound a little discouraging. Uh, it's going to take so long. But there's a wonderful footnote in God Speaks, where it's pointed out that Baba says we have 500 million slackings where we come into a form and leave that form. 500 million of them. Well, when you reach the human being, you've only got 8,400,000 left. Yeah. But when you reach the Jim Wilson stage, you've got millions way back in your history already. So, <laughs> first of all, to be born on planet Earth, yeah. as Bob has explained, is a tremendous advancement. To be born on the planet where the possibility of spiritual advancement can happen. Right. That's one thing in itself. Then, yeah. look, it's like this, you know, anybody in this world can have interest in Meher Baba, can learn about Meher Baba. If you don't want to have feelings, you can study. If you want to approach it from a purely intellectual avenue, you can do that. You can compare his so-called teachings against any others, can do all of that if you have interest in finding the truth. can do all of those things. Why don't they? Why don't they? Because they don't have the interest due to a lack of past connections. And in the process, as Baba says, in the process of reincarnation, the human being in the state of reincarnation is faced 
with innumerable distractions constantly. And these distractions are reinforced by most other people who are pretending they have great satisfaction in pursuing these distractions. <laughs> so it seems, from all that's obvious, it seems, what are you wasting your time on this for? You, you're missing the fun in life. It's all supposed to be fun. So then I remember another saying from Adi K. Arani. Run after the fun in life and miss the joy in life. Uh, well, Peter, my punchline was kind of that once we finish out the animal stages and we come into the human being, we have now completed 98.4% of the journey from leaving the home point yes. to coming into God realization. Yeah. So we're not that far away from home. No, it's just the painful, the painful last distance. It's like running yeah. the marathon and the, the end, you're almost feeling like you're dead and yeah. it hurts too bad. Yeah. But really speaking at this point, and Padre told me once, you know, when they were younger and it was tough to be with Baba and he would feel so discouraged. And he said, Baba would look at him and say, you had no idea. You are, you are that that close to the end now, that, like that, we tell them, it's, it's basically, essentially, it's over, it's over, just, just wait it out, have patience and wait it out at this point, but then we have to remember what Mara would say, you know, she says, it's not the time, it's not the speed in which you reach the destination, it's how you save her, that Time with him. That's it. It's the charm is in the end. The whole purpose of all everything, evolution of consciousness, passing through reincarnation, all that suffering unnecessarily, all of that should all pay the dividend in a way of charm in the end game. But in the end, it's not always like that. To so look at people like Gulmai, how she was tortured in life, you know, because at the end, there's an acceleration, and the masters are doing that. There's this acceleration of unwinding, of unwinding everything, and that's not fun. So I remember the words of Padre. I use this phrase once in a while, people ask. It was some conversation one day, and people were light, and something, and Padre said, yeah, you shake his head, and he said, Yes, well, remember, the main responsibility of the master is to make you know more. If you think that is a pleasant experience, you are cruelly mistaken. But, that being said, now remember something money would tell us. He said, really, to be with Baba, You've got to have a, one of the things you have to have is a sense of humor. She said there were three H's. It was humility, humor, and forget what the third one was. Humor. Take it lightly. Baba said, it's all illusion. Baba would sometimes quote Hafiz and remind them. Hafiz would say, in this dream of life, there is happiness and misery but they are both just a dream. So why not be happy? <laughs> Great way to hey, end the session. Thank hey, you. Nice to Baba. see you all. Hey, Baba. Baba Hello to France. Baba. Hey, Baba. Thank you, Peter. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Baba. Thank you, dear. Jay right. Bob, everybody. Nice see you all. Jay Bob. Jay Bob. That was fun. Thank you, Peter, for bringing us so much insight. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> see you in 45 minutes. <laughs>